Thank you for attending the Craft Beer Professionals Spring Virtual Conference. This year's event is sponsored by Arrive Point of Sale, River Drive Cooperage, and White Labs. I'm your moderator for this event. My name is Audra Gay Junas. I'm the owner of Brood for Her Ledger and the finance manager for Crooked Stave. I'm a fractional CFO for the industry, coast to coast, and I'm super stoked to be able to have these amazing guests online with us today. We're gonna to be talking about the hidden costs of canning wines. And with us, we have a wonderful series of panelists. Uh, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. Joe, how about we start with you? Hi everybody, my name is Joe Wells. I'm the head brewer at Fair State Brewing Cooperative. We're a uh, mid-sized regional craft brewery in the Twin Cities. So I hope to see everybody at CBC in a couple months. And before I started here at Fair State about oh, four years ago, um, I spent some time at Toppling Goliath in Iowa at building a brewery up in Canada called Bench Brewing and then also at Hangar 24 in Southern California. Awesome. Tyler. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, Tyler Jones, um, co-owner, executive brewer of Blackhawk Brewing here in Oxford, Connecticut. Um, been here since the beginning. We're going on eight years now. Um, I was up in New Hampshire, born and raised, but I was working, uh, worked at Forza 3 underneath Todd Mott. Smutty Nose there for a while as well um, at the old location before they moved to the new location. So, um, but yeah, so I've been in the industry since 2006. So I've been brewing since then. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thank you. Ken. You say can help. Yes. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> It's hard to hear. Um, yeah, okay. so hi, hi guys, my name's Ken. I, I currently am a service technician for Wild Goose. Um, I've been here at this company almost a year and a half. I'd say a year, year and a third. Uh, I do the same thing for Twin Monkeys as well. Um, I used to work for Boulder Bear Company in packaging and, uh, and shipping. Um, I've also worked for Oscar Blues when he first opened up Dale. Um, hand canning beer, actually, back in the day in a shed. Wow. Um, so yeah, I've kind of had my hands in the industry and a, a few of the few of the things. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today too. Yep. So let's um, let's kick things off and talk about a little bit about your experience that you have each of you do with canning lines um, and what your current situation canning situation is with your respective breweries. Tyler, how about we start with you? Sure. Um, yeah. So we we originally when we first started we used Ironheart, who was using a wild goose line. Um, they would come up and can for us. Um, then we, we looked into trying to getting our own line. Uh, we were with another company other than wild goose to start off just because we were worried about the initial cost of getting into the, the wild goose lines. But after running with them for about three, two and a half years, we kind of outgrew it quite rapidly and then started talking and grabbed ourselves a, uh, a goose line. So we got the WG four. Uh, right now, um, hoping to expand to that fifth head very shortly, which would be super exciting. Um, and then, uh, you know, working on a SCA half pint depal. Um, basically, we did everything on so we could put them on casters because where our candy line is currently set up, uh, we actually is our old tasting room space because we expanded and uh, we're able to use that space for private parties. So we'll run Monday through Thursday uh, or even Fridays, depending how much canning we have to get done and then roll it all out of the way and then they'll clean the floors and set it up for a private party over the weekend. Oh, that's awesome. That um, <laughs> reminds me of when we got our canning line. I was the CEO of Bramari Brewing for four years and we didn't have any space to set it up permanently either. And so we ended up um, putting it on casters and had to roll it in and out after every fill before we opened in the public. It was it was wild. <laughs> so hats well, yeah. off to you. It's a lot sure. of work. It's, it's insane. No, I mean, when we first started, he had the uh, we were actually we were open on Wednesdays and we had to move it out every Wednesday for Wednesday to move it back. And then luckily we got some more space for our tasting room. So we don't we only have to move it once a week now. <laughs> yeah, I feel your pain. <laughs> Joe, how about you? Your experience with canning lines in your brewery's current canning situation? Yeah, so we currently have a five head wild goose uh, with the, um, the, I think the one of the last, if not the last, automated wild goose depalletizers attached to it. Um, we also have, you know, our canning line is uh, five head now, started off as a four head, and we are just, I think, in the next couple months, crossing the 10 million can mark on it. So uh, 
uh, built a few cans on it. Before that, uh, I worked with a Cronus Craftmate big rotary head filler uh, and another wild goose for that and a uh, cast line, a very, very old, old cast line before that. So uh, built, built a lot of cans. Wow, yeah, that's quite a breath too. <laughs> like you hit all the big ones. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ken, um, you give us a little bit about your background to um, anything else you want to add from your experience? Sure. Um, I guess a lot of my experience, you know, initially it came working with twin monkeys. You know, we I built the machines and did installs with them. Uh, from there, you know, I decided to move on to something a little bit bigger and better and, you know, join the Wild Goose team. With that, with that being said, you know, I've had my hands on experience with Scott Depal's uh, labeling. Um, anything uh, any of the auxiliary equipment that goes in a, with a whole canning line setup so um currently i travel around most of the time from brewery to brewery helping the you know train the staff get them up to speed on how to operate their new machines um if not i'm going to service machines troubleshoot things like that cool awesome so when you were budgeting to buy your canning line we'll go back to the breweries here um, what did you have to take into account um, Joe, let's start with you this time. And if you had any sort of unexpected costs along the way, let's talk about that as well. Yeah. So for us, um, you know, the the unexpected cost is always the install and uh, utilities. You know, nobody ever thinks like, oh yeah, I've got to run all this electricity over here. Oh wait, the wire is expensive and the panel is 400 feet away. Uh, so you know, working out your utilities, figuring out how much compressed air you actually need, how clean the compressed air needs to be. Uh, we we had some issues with our first um, air compressor where the dryer um, on the air compressor died multiple times. It was a whole kerfuffle, um, and that meant wet air, which then meant wet solenoids in the wild goose, which was uh, you know kind of down the rabbit hole of all kinds of issues, but. Um, making sure you've got the utilities laid out uh, and have them very solidified, pay for itself in dividends. Yeah, it's been, I'm, I'm working with a brewery right now in, on the West Coast and wiring costs are insane and what they've gone through the roof. You know, we had the issue with lumber before and build out costs and quotes changing every 15 days and wiring now has become a huge component of that and that definitely ties in with the canning line. Wilds, um, yeah, wild world we're currently living in. Tyler, how about you? Let's talk about um, what when you went were budgeting to buy your canning line. What did you take into account, and what un unexpected costs you incurred along the way? Yeah, I mean, budgeting. I mean, the quote you get from Wild Goose isn't everything. You also got to have, you know, the labeler, the the deep out, the the collection table, kind of all you know, everything beyond the canning line we weren't really thinking about, we were like, oh, we'll just hand pack it into things. And then once we got running and because the goose crushes and flies, we're like, oh man, this is, we need a lot more equipment on the back end of this machine. Um, and that's kind of where it comes into space wise too, of like where you wanted to be. Uh, we had to make some decisions of what equipment we were buying just because the label we wanted was, you know, six feet too long to then be in the way. So we had to buy the, the smaller one and make it work in the system. So um, having the, looking at the layout with everything included all the way through is super important. Um, if you just, you know, when you're planning it from day one. Um, and now, I mean, I guess it's probably a lot better with you guys got a lot of everything connected all at once, but we were trying to make an old, the deep, an old uh, deep palletizer collection table as our, as our, uh, old, as our collection table off of the goose. So it's just kind of like making all the heights and everything adjust and everything where it needs to be. Uh, that was kind of one of our biggest, headaches in the beginning was making all just making a smooth transition um we've had some the same similar idea with the electrical side of it too um really making sure you have enough power where you need it to be as you start plugging you're like oh i got enough power for the line but then you also you plug it in the depal you plug it in the labeler you plug it in the collection table um you plug, if you have a date coder you plug in a date coder and you know depending and where and where along the line those are all getting plugged in where we put a bunch of power in one spot and then now we're like, oh, we can't run an 80 foot extension cord. So now we're going to put another power over here. Having a really good blueprint would be a huge advantage for sure. Uh, looking to install your new line. Did you have to make any modifications to your outfit or anything to the, the space itself then that cost you any additional out of pocket? No, no we, uh, 
because we still like Arcadian line space is where we hold, host private parties. Like the modification side of that was like we couldn't, we're kind of limited to where we could do. So all of our modifications were uh, building a new stand for the label labeler so that it would fit and be adjustable in the right positioning, um, cutting down our accumulation table to get it to the right height. Like we adjusted the back end equipment to fit the goose more than anything um, on our end. But yeah, we didn't. We, other than running electrical, we didn't have to really do much modification of the space. Oh, cool. Awesome. Um, Joe, did you have any mods to the space that you had to make for your line? Uh, we had a few. You know, our, our facility is pretty um, uh, non ideal for a brewery, but we have um, curbing that goes around the areas where we have trench drains, and our depalletizer sits inside that curbing. So we had to cut out a curb. So we can actually get a forklift close enough to set pallets of cans into it, uh, which is um, just super fun whenever the forklift then hits the decal tire <laughs> four or five inches, uh, which happens more often than it should. But, uh, you know, that was probably the only like facility change we had to do other than running CO2 and um, compressed air and water and electricity. Uh, and more electricity and more electricity. <laughs> so Ken, um, I know that you've seen a lot, you know, in your role as a technician and a technical specialist, what kind of unexpected costs have you come in and seen um, on your client's behalf that you well, can share with the group? Well, you know, I, you know, I think these guys have covered a lot. Um, you know, Tyler made a point about, you know, in both Tyler and Joe about electricity. Um, you know, you're also sharing uh, CO2, you know, oxygen. Um, you have pneumatic systems that are throughout the brewery. Um, obviously, brewers know they're using CO2 as well. Sometimes uh, they got to realize that, you know, they're going to start requiring a little bit more of those, uh, those things. Um, and kind of to add on to what Tyler was saying, you know, you know, initially when people get buy a canning line, they're kind of ready to can, but they don't you know, they don't realize all these these auxiliary things they need to add and even go further than that usually when you buy a canning line that's you know that's the next step of a business but then you got to start thinking in the future okay what are we going to do when, once we start expanding what kind of space what kind of things are we going to need for that um so yeah there, there's a variety of things um and you know as that time elapses you know there's wear and tear on machines so um you know that could require service visits from one of us uh parts um things like that um you know I, I think my whole philosophy is more preventive maintenance and trying to have that foresight to try to avoid uh, avoid those kind of expenses <clears throat> well yeah so uh tyler will throw this out at you uh, yeah. what factors or features did you consider the most important to your return on that investment was it speed uptime sellable yield talk a little bit about what factors or features you saw that were most important? Yeah, so I mean, the big reason we went with Goose is just DO levels. I mean, we were looking, we're getting great DO levels and keeping them shelf stability. Because um, I mean, we're 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 in the middle of nowhere, Connecticut. Uh, we do have a tasting room. If you ever want to come by, please do. Uh, but you know, ninety five percent of our liquid goes out the door to distro. So um, you know, for us, it was uh, you know, quality of the seams, quality of DO levels, making sure that we have shelf stable beer um, and no problems along the way um and then i mean there was there's some good um again i mentioned my space again but there was you know, we 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 worked with that along the way and there's some really great augmentations that we got with just being able to instead of shooting straight off the back you know, came with a came with the 90s who so we were able to keep everything linear and just to be able to find all these different variations that you can put together to make the goose fit your space you know and that's really was huge for us too um so, I mean, that's uh, that was our big selling points of, of the wild and expandability. We were excited that we're like, hey, we like you mentioned, plan for expansion. So we're like, all right, we're going to buy the floor, but we, we know we can drop that fifth head into it if we needed it down the road. Um, just having that in our back pocket. But I mean, that opens a whole can of worms of like, well, if we did that, then our labeler is going to be too slow. So we got to increase the labeler and then add six feet. So we should upgrade the DPAL with that new rotary so we can put it on a net. You know, the, the space of my brewery is insane, but uh the uh the ability for expansion with the goose has been huge for us now you know quality of the liquid is number one obviously but the expandability from after that was huge for me awesome um joe what about you your long-term investment what factors were most important to you 
you know, for us, it's it's pretty similar. It's the uh, the quality. You know, trying to keep those as low as possible. You know, with our wild goose, we're able to shoot below fifty parts per billion easily without a lot of work, um, which is with a giant chicken dito. Um, so that's that's great. Uh, I'm pretty confident sending beer out the door that's below that. Um, and then you know. A few, a, a few kind of intangible factors matter a, a fair bit, like how much is maintenance going to cost me and how easy is maintenance to do myself? You know, I've, I've worked on other lines where, uh, you know, you needed training from the factory to open the thing up and, you know, we don't want to pay $10,000 to fly somebody from Austria out to open the machine and fix something. Um, and the wild goose is pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you know, same with the cast lines. They're pretty simple. Anybody with a handful of Allen keys and a, a ball and hammer can get into submission and get to do what you need to do. So um, ease of maintenance, cost of maintenance, you know, all those, all those Festo rotary valves are expensive, but at least I know I can get them next day air and replace it in about 15 minutes, which is pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, as I've been traveling around too, I'm noticing TPO being like a biggest factor. One of that, just because they can see uh, it's too big of a risk to take nowadays. If that's your first to market product that you're putting out there and it's less than desirable product, you can't depend on the seamer. You're not exactly sure what's going on. Like that TPO is like, I, I hear that being at the top of the list for most everybody. So um, now then Joe, like looking more from a long range perspective, longevity, looking in the future, then coming back to the present day. Uh, are you looking at like your machines over the lifespan, like your ability to upgrade? I know Tyler mentioned expandability. That is an important factor, but resale value, anything else, like when you're looking at what the total, not just return on investment is going to be, but what you want to do with it further on down the road. What are other factors taking into account that you took um, looking over a longer range of time? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for us, I'm not super concerned about resale value on our wild goose because I'm going to run it until it's dead. Um, and by dead, <laughs> I mean, it's like the ship of thesis. At this point, there's not a lot left on it than the chassis that's original. Um, let us know when that happens <laughs> yeah a lot of parts get replaced over time um but, you know there is there is a secondary market for these, these things especially when the lead times are 18 or 24 weeks and people want to clean line yesterday uh, so you know you can get rid of equipment pretty pretty easily um, and make some money on it, which is nice uh, but, you know, for us we you know Minnesota has some kind of odd beer laws, so we're not going to be growing to the point where we need to buy a 50 head rotary filler anytime soon. So uh, our little five head in line, we can get good DOs on it. We can run it with two, three people, and uh, we can we can get done what we need to get done. So, Tyler, anything else from longevity perspective? Were you looking at resale value? I mean, you talked about expansion, which is of course like extremely important. And I'm, I love hearing that you're designing for the future and not just trying to get something in the door to get product out. Um, anything else from a long-term perspective to add? No, I mean, I'm in the same boat. Like I, I, I'm not foreseeing us get big enough where we're going to need to get that the bigger line um i mean space wise we don't we don't have the room for it so the um uh, my expansion my, my expansion plan is to that five head and then just run it until she dies you know i mean it's like it's it's a it's a great machine that's been doing really well for us um much better than the last line we have on the do's and the speed and uh you mentioned like just labor cost on it too like yeah i mean we we have two guys they run it easily by themselves and once you get all the right equipment in the front end and the back end of it she just runs super smooth and uh keeps making beer uh go out the door and that's kind of what we're, we're keep on doing right yeah <laughs> um so was your install um was that included in the cost of canning when you got the quote initially was it not and um talk about a little bit about your installation process yeah i mean i can start so um yeah, I mean, we had a we had a tech come and you know train our you know hang out and train um, to the two guys we're gonna have run it. Um, 
they have since both moved on and have they trained my the replacements on it so i mean the training was good enough for them to be able to train someone behind him which is good um but yeah he you know came out ran with us did uh three batches um through the canning line making sure we knew what all the bells and whistles and gave us our fine-tuned adjustments so it was running great for our system and um set us on a really good course um we just had a we just had one of our uh, our put the push arm level le levers seal go and it was blowing oxygen underneath the lid. We were getting crazy DOs. We couldn't find it. We ended up having someone come out and uh, spend the day with us, and a day like one replacement valve and a day of a couple more tweaks. And we were back to right where we were supposed to be. So it's having that ability. I mean, luckily, when the the new rep that um, that for Wild Goose just moved to an hour and a half from us over just over the border into Massachusetts. So we got someone close and local that will come down and hang out. But uh, they, um, the reps have been great. Like any like big problem we have, they were there. They were, did all the right, did all the right installs, helped us out and then got us even better to where we were because we, you know, over time people get lazy, um, get to be retrained and um, just that quick one day retrain. We were right back to day one of, you know, we were, we were, we were pushing that, you know, 60, 70, 80 range. And all of a sudden now we're back in the twenties again, just for making sure we're doing the, the right timing and on everything. So it's been, uh, it's been super helpful just having that support from wild goose for sure. Awesome. Yeah. I've, um, I've found that, uh, once a year, even if it's just like a half day to, it's almost like continuing education and getting retrained, going through, looking at what new developments have, um, come up, found the pipe. And just a nice refresh and it really helps with productivity and time savings which ultimately hooks your financial statements my area <laughs> um joe talk about how about you let's talk about your um installation did your install get included in the cost in the quote and talk about your install process so uh actually i don't know if it was here because the install happened before our uh, but, you know, when I was in Canada, we did a wild goose install and the installation was included. And uh, one of the things that uh, we did was try to set the groundwork as much as possible for the wild goose tech to show up and have the line be, you know, a half a day's work from running instead of a day and a half of work from running. That way we were able to get as much time actually running the line with a tech who knew how to run it and as much training of our staff, which was, uh, which was great. I mean, they are, you know, they're not complicated machines, but they are touchy machines. They've got a lot of adjustments, you know, they've got to, so that way they can handle, you know, filling the carbonated beer without counter pressure. So uh, having as much time with your staff, with the wild goose reps there, or, you know, any other pipeline reps there uh, is, is pretty nice. Um, we are also very lucky that we we share a building with a mobile canning company. So uh, we have, you know, four or five guys, you know, 150 feet away who run wild goose lines every day, which has been very helpful for us uh, to get some extra, extra staff training when we need it. <laughs> and um, Ken, especially, I love your perspective too, that you can offer on the install process. I work with a lot of startups out there and they're not sure what that process even begins to look like. So can you uh, share a little bit about what that process is like from your side? Yeah, that, you know, that, that whole process even starts before I even get there. You know, we already in contact with the customers. We're, you know, making sure they've received the machine. They're on creating it, make sure all the necessary hookups, make sure they got the electricity, power, you know, all those things we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, we even talk about, you know, what, what do they want to can, make sure they got the right temperature, make sure they got the right carbonation level. Um, you know, we want these installs to go kind of seamless as possible, you know, with minimal waste and make sure, you know, the customer's kind of set up for success. So um, those are just some of the things we do be, even before I get there. Um, and then, you know, obviously when we get there, we're going to run through the machine and just make sure it's mechanically sound and, you know, we're going to start canning. We're going to get everybody kind of a, an opportunity to get their hands on the driver with and make sure they're comfortable, um, you know, before we leave. And that's kind of our job. Um, ultimately, we want our customers to be successful running the machines. Um, 
you know, that doesn't even stop there. Even when we leave, they, uh, you know, we have really good relationships with our customers and close relationships where they can email us anytime, call us anytime. Um, and we're, we're, we're pretty uh, quick on responses and make sure they get the help that they need. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the whole idea, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you spend all this time brewing your product, um, investing in your brewery, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're that next step where you can get that product out the door with minimal waste, minimal cost and all that. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit then about timing. So the customer places the order for a line. Um, they've made yep. the final payment or they're talk a little bit about time and expectations because some people aren't. I'm sure yeah, they'll talk more about that's it. That's true, yeah. <laughs> no, and I get that. And uh, we see that a lot. You know, people are very excited. They're like, all right, we got our new canning line. However, you know, we've been pretty busy. The pandemic is really uh, um, added to that as well. It's just yeah. uh, the, the, these canning lines have been a lifeline for breweries. So, um, you know, we have, we're sometimes pushed back, uh, you know, seven, six to eight weeks on the calendar. So sometimes they have to wait that long to get that, you know, that uh, technician out there to train them. So, um, you know, like I said, we try to get a hold of them ahead of time. So there's a couple of things that they can kind of cross off the list before we get there. Um, it gives them ample time to be prepared and get everything ready as well. So. <clears throat> How many um, days on average then? So the line arrives and you're commissioning it, you're getting it ready to run. Uh, from what can they expect in terms of training, onboarding, uh, in terms of overall time, ex yeah, time expectations and any additional resources? Sure. That they need to well, as, as far as like, you know, the, the, the experience that, you know, Tyler and Joe have with their machines, with that type of machine, we're going to spend about three days on site. Okay. Uh, you know, we have smaller machines. We'll be there for a day. We have larger machines that will be there for a week. Um, you know, usually the first day is just kind of hanging out and, you know, being acquainted, make sure everything runs well. Then we spend the next two canning, canning beer or whatever product it is. Um, you know, we're there to try and shoot also, make sure, you know, over those, that time span that, you know, everything goes smoothly and that they're um, you know, ultimately self-sufficient. Uh, to the best of their ability once once we leave <clears throat> okay Th thank you tyler uh would yep. you say about three days from the cans arrival to commissioning it to getting it run up and running training what was your personal experience yeah i mean like you said the uh i mean the we had a crazy thing with our depal that damaged in shipping but we uh we were able to get another one really quickly which was awesome so we had to reschedule the original commissioning of the line uh, because of that. Um, luckily there was CiderCon going on. So we got the floor model <laughs> shipped out to us from Chicago, which was great. Uh, yeah. But we, uh, so we got it all set up. Once we get all un uncreated and put together, um, yeah, like you said, we did a lot of stuff ourselves because we're just, you know, we're excited. It's a new toy, we went open the box, you know? So we open it all up and get it, get it on its casters and roll it in position and make sure all of our, all of my tape measure measurements made sense and you know it could still get a pallet in the back of it um and then uh got it hooked up and you know had then they showed up yeah that day one when they were there we were running um spitting out onto a spitting out just onto a table just running the cans and hand packing and then we um because we you know we started without having them the labeler or the the accumulation table after the fact so it was just kind of a we just ran cans through and just we're learning how to run the line and but it was just great like i mean just like the refresh you mentioned earlier the the day one training was great um take you right through front to back learn every single piece along the way what they all do why they're important and then how to adjust them and then running running that those beers and getting that that nice frothy head with no the no fro guys, it's smooth, literate on top, low DOs from day one, and just like, yeah, all right, this line's gonna crush. This is great, you know. So it's just fun just to have that experience of, and it's just so clean day one. I mean, it's just it's never been as clean as it ever been coming out of the box, you know. So just having a clean line, and I can remember that day. It's been great. Um, but yeah, so that was my experience. Yeah, three days, and then we were just we were off to the races for sure. 
Awesome. Joe, how about you? Three days, you got that line on site? Put it yeah. together, talk about yours. <laughs> I mean, pretty much the same thing. Three days and we had, you know, 90 barrels of beer cans in our cooler. Um, we were lucky enough we had, we were using uh, the last time I started up a, a line so we didn't have to worry about label or uh, jazz. We just had to worry about, you know, getting the folding table the right height for our pack off and uh, getting everything in trays and pack tech and out the door. Uh, so yeah, three days, I think was pretty active. Awesome. So I'll stick with you, Joe, on this one. Um, what necessary supply services get added into your total cost of ownership? So some examples being like compressed air, um, CO2, liquid nitrogen, talk a little bit about necessary supply services. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the, the biggest one that the canning line uses more than anything else in the building is compressed air. So um, yeah. we first bought the big, you know, the uh, rotary screw compressor, so it's quiet and it sits right next to the canning line instead of like a piston compressor, which you know, it's about 140 decibels and shakes the whole building. Uh, and we ended up, uh, we bought the nice one that had the internal dryer. Now we have an external dryer because compressor issues. But, uh, you know, the compressor was a big cost. And then the other one that I think like is very tied up in the cost of ownership is having uh, instrumentation to measure C uh, CO2 and O2. So, like in my mind, it is um, irresponsible to be canning beer without a seat box or a halt meter. Um, so, you know, a Zomnagel is great and works, but uh, being able to really dial in with with a C box and have accurate CO2 readings um, will save you a lot of beer at the canning. It's to get a lot of low fills and. When you're looking at uh, you know 23, 24 cents for a can with a lid and a label and everything, uh, having low fills is getting more and more expensive. So you know, a C box might be thirty five thousand dollars, but it pays for itself pretty fast when you start throwing away cases of low fills every day. Yeah, I'm still shocked that there's some startups out there that ask me if they even a Zaman Nagel even is necessary like can i just get by without a zama nagel can i get like something absolutely minimum <laughs> yes please i, I love that you went to the c box level not everybody can afford that but um i love that you place the importance on that it's uh, it's critical absolutely critical tyler how about you um total cost of ownership anything that joe hasn't covered anything you'd like to add yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the getting nice Anton Parr in here and getting so you make sure you're shelf stable. And if you want to make adjustments to try to speed up the line that you're not increasing your DOs along the way, that's been a huge thing for us because there are there are some tweaks you can learn from your, your neighbor who in case if they're a, a mobile canning line, because those guys know how to like really push the lines as fast as possible. Uh, but sometimes you can push them too far where you're starting to increase your DO level. So having having that instrumentation to make sure you're like, I can tweak this and get another two cans a minute, but then all of a sudden now I'm at 300 parts from, you know, that's that's way you oh, gotta gosh. make sure you're doing it the right way. Um, so yeah, that instrumentation is huge. Um, and uh, date coding too has been good for us too. Um, and we originally had a much le less expensive date coder um, that, you know, may have to manually clean and then someone forgets to manually clean it and, and then you're like replacing parts and just constantly like, constant battle like we spent the money on a really nice date coder that had a built-in cleaning head everything so you just press a button at the end of the run and it gets clean and it's helped out tr tremendously on that end for um getting into those chain those chain outlets love the date codes at the bottom of their cans you know if they, they don't if you want to if they don't see a date code they, they, i mean we had dri we drove we drove to massachusetts to like headquarters before we before we got our goose and they just literally sat in a meeting this is back in like shirt and ties and everything and then they pulled the cans up look at the bottom like oh no date code sorry I'm like oh that would have been a great thing to say in the email you know so um so yeah so just having that date code on the can and like really like 
having a way to make sure that you're tracking your lots along the way and tracking it on the shelf for your sales guys has been huge for us. So that's kind of, and that's getting one that has um, a reusable, the reusable uh, reservoir. So you're not just burning through solvent all the time, like spend the money on the decoder. Cause there's a lot of those little boxes of ink are expensive. So uh, just kind of keeping that going. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, finding, finding the cans and the lids and everything, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conference we can talk about, but um, it's just finding the, the raw materials and getting them in house in time, um, having enough storage just for pallets and pallets and pallets of empty cans. It's just been yeah. insane of how much like space that takes up. Um, but really looking at your space, um, your output, and then realizing if you don't have enough space to store a full truckload of cans, you're going to pay more for those cans, you know? So it's, uh, everything about it is kind of just a, um, bigger is better in some way, but not always better. Kind of confusing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, from the technical side, uh, but anything you'd like to add, um, as a total cost of ownership that neither one of these gentlemen has mentioned? No, uh, they're, they're spot on. Um, you know, uh, everything you're doing from the starting of brewing your beer to getting those cans into your warehouse to getting your day coder set up to all that, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything if you don't have good DO or tight seams. So um, to their point, you know, it's a great long-term investment in making sure that your product, you know, has the right DO and then also to check your seams as well to make sure they're nice and tight. Uh, ultimately, in the long run, if, if you're not doing those things, that's going to just equate to major losses and time waste and frustration. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I would add to that. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, what about the process and the costs? or um, the savings of adding any integrated equipment automation into the whole packaging layout. Tyler, you mentioned a DPAL that you were having some issues with. So I was like, ooh, add on, add on. Okay, he's the first person I wanna to talk to. Let's talk about that, that process of adding on and in increasing the automation of the packaging layout and the experience. So DPAL labeler conveyance, in feed out any of that let's let's see what what you got <laughs> for sure no um all that stuff like when you look at the price tags of all that stuff you're like man if i spend that much for a conveyor that just moves a can of beer around you know but it's um really it comes down to labor costs when it comes down to it where if like yeah. if we we're running if i was running you know the wild goose quote you get a deep palletizer in the canning line if you're running that just it's spitting cans out you're gonna have two guys in the end collecting cans, making cases, another guy pack decking and stacking, you know, like just all of this stuff along the way, like having those, those add-ons along the way has helped tremendously where we're able to, I mean, honestly, the best piece of equipment I have is our pack deck applicator because just carpal yeah. tunnel and safety of people's ankle and just like <laughs> the time savings. It's just like, I love that piece of machinery because it's just been that was our final add-on and it was once that happened the line was easily two guys easy to run you know you could run it with two guys without it but it was a struggle and like you'd have to have you know a floater coming in and moving pallets and helping out and doing stuff along the way but once you get all that once you get the you get the full flow your deep pal your twist rinse your date coder your filler uh pack deck up labeler pack deck applicator accumulation table so that accumulation table of finished product the person running that end can go change out labels or something or put another stack of pack packs in and run back um once we had all that the, the line just became super smooth to run the two guys and um and when when we have the, the next expansion to add that fifth head it'll be just as smooth to run with those five heads too so um that's the big thing it just is more of a it's more of a labor cost savings and um you know labor cost you don't have to pay for health insurance on a pack deck applicator right <laughs> yeah yeah i remember i was um creating a financial case i was going to take the bank for adding a line um and then adding some automation into the line and what it was from the labor perspective we're going you know, I, I was just observing our guys out on the line working out we have five people on it 
the fact that we could reduce it to two to two and a half uh, by adding some automation in there. I looked at our labor costs. I calculated how quickly that payback period would be. I did a discounted cash flow analysis. I basically laid it out for the bank that, look, this is how much cost savings, this is the payback period. Here's our sales that are tied to that savings so that we can prove that we're financially viable and paying it back. And making a case to the owners is often important as well. If you have outside investors, giving them that payback period and say, look, this is a $30,000 piece of equipment, but we need it not only to help in, in, um, increase safety measures within the brief, because you have a lot of the dangerous aspects of, of a lot of these um, taken out, but the carpal tunnel, even that, like taking that out with the PACTAC applicator, um, time savings, the money savings, and then the payback period. So just proving financial viability and the labor cost is such a key component and being able to track that and really measure that Sometimes even run by run is really, really helpful for you to figure out what your total cost is. But um, I, I work with that a lot. And um, it's really easy to build a financial case, especially when you assume conservative flat sales. So um, anybody looking out there, build a financial case for your bank. <laughs> um, you know, there's, Dill, yeah. There's another mm -hmm. aspect to that, though, and I've seen this out in the field is is um, you know once you start adding this automation, you're actually able to supply the demand, right? Oh um, yeah, yep. You know mm -hmm. sometimes uh, not having some of this equipment kind of inhibits that, and you know I've seen that the the stress that certain brewers and uh, breweries are put under because they can't reach that uh, demand and they're spending long hours, long days. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it it's kind of a element of freedom in, in a sense. That's such a great point. Yeah, it definitely moves product faster um, that you can then meet the, the demand um, a right. little bit more effectively. It takes some bottlenecks out for sure, because a lot of times the bottleneck is a piece that hasn't been automated at that point, and you can only move as fast as the slowest link, right? So exactly. when you can things up, yeah, definitely. Great point. Um, Joe, how about you? Um, are there... Uh, have you added any sort of automation, added anything on PayPal, Labeler? Talk a little, if do you have anything that you'd like to add on yeah. in, in the process yeah. of adding that on too? So, you know, our setup is pretty, uh, we, we have a lot of square footage, which is really nice. Um, so we're, we're one of the rarities in breweries, we're not in a shoebox. Um, <laughs> We, we have a DPAL, uh, twist rinse, runs through the canning line and then kicks out the back side. And then from there, we, we were really uh, fortunate that we randomly having a beer with a gentleman who is the warehouse manager at a um, like top uh, brewery. And he said, oh yeah, I've got a graveyard full of uh, conveyor belts that we don't use anymore. And so we picked up, um, I, we got a 10 foot four inch conveyor and then a 12 foot uh, 12 inch conveyor. So we got a fair amount of accumulation that we seven or eight cases full could fit onto that conveyor belt before labeler and then a pack off conveyor. And I mean, I think we picked them all up for like less than three grand um just you know, song of advance price so you know that allows us to leave the canning line running when we switch out a roll of labels on our labeler or leave the canning line running when somebody's got to use the can and they run off for five minutes and then come back and you don't have to shut down and then have the losses of your your hose warming up and uh, really helps smooth things out quite a bit um, having all of that accumulation space after uh, canning before packing off. Um, we also go into 12 packs uh, with a, um, a Brewski 100 uh, carton bluer, which uh, we do not have a fill text, so we still have to manually move from our conveyor off the line onto the conveyor for the 12 packer. That way we can fill the cans and make 
make sure that we're not, you know, filling a filling 12 packs with cans that weigh, you know, grams. Um, so, you know, at most we're using three people to run that whole setup, one managing the line, one doing the handoff weighing, and then one person packing off uh, 12 packs into, into trays on the pallets and then run the forklift around. It's a, it's a pretty big operation in terms of square footage, but it allows us to you know, get running and then keep running, which is helped the field a lot. You said you have three people that run the line on every three run? Three we're doing 12 packs, uh, like two and a half when we're running uh, four packs or six packs. We, we gave up uh, techs about a month ago and switched over to the West Rock can collars. Which is like a, an applicator that applies the whole case at once, uh, which has uh, been really nice for the staff who are working. It's a lot less busy work and a lot more just fill the tray, analyze it, and keep on working. How about um, how about you, Tyler? How many people uh, take it to run the canning line, um, and any labor costs that are a go above and beyond in having to work with them on the line? Yeah, for sure. I mean. Um we got two guys that run the line like straight up um, on, I mean, there is our, we have a warehouse guy who is always running around and doing stuff uh, because we have the half pint uh, depal. We are, we have to split our pallet of cans every time. So he goes, you know, he's over there the day before in the warehouse, splitting cans and getting them ready for everybody to load in. Uh, but yeah, I got one guy who's like managing the filler and the deep and the depalletizer kind of back and forth, uh, making sure that's all running smoothly. Um, and then uh, I wish I had some accumulation after the line. That's a great addition because it's uh, right now we come right off we come off right off a of ninety instead of the straight off the back of our goose, and it goes straight into our labeler with like you know accumulation of like six cans, seven cans, you know. So we'll uh, when we have to do the change out, you grab the four cans off to the side and give you enough room to take the label off and cut it out and get it running. Um, so if we had more room, I'd love to put one of those rotaries in that space just so you can block it off and then change, and open it back up. Um, and then it goes feeds down uh, through that to uh, just the the pack deck applicator, and then onto our, our pretty large, just like four by five accumulation table um, that just for like fills sills them down to the end of it. And so uh, that one guy in the end is more of the time just packing out cases and stacking on trays. He's also keeping an eye on the pack deck supply, going in and loading that in, keeping an eye on the labeler, make sure no cans have fallen over and getting stuck in the labeler, which makes a whole nother mess in itself. Um, but yeah, so I guess it's officially too, but we do have that warehouse guy who comes and grabs pallets and moves them around. Um, we, we do some limited uh, variety packs. Uh, we don't have any like the uh, equipment. Um, so we'll just, we'll, we'll run, we'll run with a, the, the pack deck applicator off and raise it and just feed the, feed the accumulation table and hand pack case, cases that are unpacked deck and then hand pack at a later date once we get the four different varieties of pallets set up. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's that's kind of the how we're running it. Um, I mean, the kind of to go back a little bit to what we were talking about about how having the the saving on labor costs, but it's also it's making those jobs easier for people, so that people can learn other, be able to do other things too. So I'm, I'm really hoping, you know, the guy who's on my back of the line, I want to train him on the fill the line, and that gives you two or three, give you like three extra people that can run the line. So. God forbid someone wants to go on vacation. The canning line can go still be running, you know, like, like have the line keep going and uh, having the ability to have that training is huge. Um, and the ability to do that is all comes from having all of this. Cause if, if someone's just there taking cans off the line, like they're in, I love Lucy, there's no way they're going to learn how to run the filler, you know? So it's a, uh, it's a having, having that, having that back end stuff really helps on that end of it for sure. <laughs> I love that episode, by oh, the way. I crazy. think everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry you were bringing it. was awesome. <laughs> um, so Ken, I'm going to turn to you for this next question. Uh, what kind of maintenance support or service costs does a canning line require and how should a brewery budget for it? You know, I guess it really, it, it, that's a term on the size of the canning line, <clears throat> but you know, you are going to have some manual things, right? Uh, with our machines, we do, for example, include spare parts that come with that machine, but you know, cylinders go out, you know, you're going to need to replace some of the product line, some of the tubing. 
Um, you know, some of those uh, more mechanical things, you know, you can spend anywhere. You can spend anywhere depending on the frequency they use it. So I guess there's no good formula, but I'd say people probably spend maybe a thousand or three thousand dollars a year, maybe, um, if everything goes well. Uh, we do have a lot of customers that schedule an annual site visit um, just to make sure that they have somebody come by, tune up the machine, make sure that you know everything's working right. Um, and also there's that element of turnover uh, that you see in the industry as well. So getting traf uh, staying re or, I'm sorry, staff retrained, you know, so that they're operating machines right and um, you know we're not wasting product and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, you know, ultimately, we're really what it comes down to is, is the what I mentioned earlier is the preventative maintenance side of thing, you know, so we try to reiterate as much as we can on just taking care of that machine as well as you can. Um, uh, just as you know, so you're not spending these unforeseen costs. Um, you know, I was kind of laughing earlier, you know, both these guys mentioned once their machines die, I've seen machines with 30 million cycles. So, uh, you know, you can take care of them, they'll, they'll keep running. Um, you know, the best thing you can do is always have something on the shelf though. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I always encourage people to prevent pre preemptively, you know, purchase a couple extra cylinders here, purchase a couple extra sensors here. That way you're not dead in the water, um, which ultimately, you know, can, you know, waste some money as well. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, Joe. How, how do you budget for maintenance support and service costs for your candy line? Uh, well, you know, we write a budget and then we spend way too much on maintenance to support our <laughs> you know, we have a budget next year, increase it, and then we spend too much. Uh, you know, the, I think probably the, the smartest thing was um, you know, so a year ago or so, um, I was talking with our packaging manager and we made the call of like, we have, you know, a set list of stuff, spare parts on the shelf at all times to save us downtime. Because you know, we're having issues with our seamer and uh, one of the rotary cylinders goes out on, on the back side of the seamer. Uh, then you're down for the day as you, you know, mail order one in and wild goose next to yours and you're paying 200 bucks for freight on it. And, uh, you know, instead, uh, get an account with Festo, order it direct from them. It takes three months for them to ship it to you, but it's on your shelf. It's ready to rock and roll and it takes, you know, less than 30 minutes to swap it out, put the new cylinder in, and you're back up in time. Um, you know, you're not paying the labor of people standing around watching a candy line run. You're uh, teaching them how to fix it, teaching them how to get it back up in there and then finishing the run for the day and actually getting the gear ready for the distributors. Uh, you know, we try to keep replacements for all of the major cylinders on the shelf. Um, as well as sensors and uh you know generally this, uh, we have it on the shelf and then we forget that we used it and uh have to rush order one every now and again but um you know, the maintenance for in my mind the cost of the maintenance is it can be pretty significant but uh downtime is is much more expensive as much as possible Hey, you mentioned a really good point that downtime, um, what, what kind of costs, how do you incorporate that? Um, what does that look like? So when you have downtime, talk a little bit about what does that mean? What are your workaround solutions? How, and how does that translate financially? Yeah, well, you know, luckily as a brewery, uh, there's always something that can be cleaned better than it's currently being cleaned. So downtime turns into cleaning time. Uh, that can be a bit redundant at the end of the day when things are pretty clean and you've got plenty of stacked up that are ready to rock and roll. Um, so, you know, downtime, we don't have a good way of assigning a dollar value to it, but it's pretty easy to do the math in your head when you're looking at three people standing there making 20 bucks an hour uh, and beer not going out the door. Um, and then you've got the associated cost then of distributor pickups and rescheduling uh, how everything works in the brewery because you know, you plan a day of no canning when you're canning five days a week for the next month and a half. Um, uh, you know, that downtime is, is almost priceless, one could say. Tyler, how about you? What does your maintenance support service cost look like for your canning line and how do you budget for it? 
Yeah, um, I agree with setting a budget and then overspending because that's kind of what we do as well. <laughs> um, but no, it's I feel like you know every time we have a problem, I like I order two of it to make sure to have the backup on the shelf, and then it's never the thing that breaks. It's always the next thing that breaks that I don't have on the shelf. So then I order two of those, and it's just like I'm slowly amassing a backup of everything. I'm waiting for the first thing to break though. Um, and then uh, you know that having the guys there that are you know willing to learn how to fix it is huge. Um, you know, it's just a, that because it, it is having it there, the time it takes to do it. Um, I've done a lot like stuff over the phone with the wild goose text and be like, hey, what's going on here? Um, how do I get into this? How do I get into the, the inner guts of this filler to replace these two little these two little rubber washers I see on this piece of paper in the manual? And I, I think they're really good about taking, you know, taking the time and uh, even to the point of like video conferencing with me and make sure that, you know, everything's going well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, downtime, you, you can always be squeegee, you know, so get, if there's anyone, you know, give, give them a squeegee, let them do some work, uh, do something yeah. along the way. Well, if we are down, but yeah, having, having, I mean, we're not, I mean, we're hoping to get to that five days a week. I mean, we're not, um, we, but we are definitely three to four days a week. So we can, we, it, it doesn't mess up everything if we're down one day, but it does put a big wrench in the system of just, the brewing schedule and the can't the big thing for us is we only are we don't have a lot of bright tanks so the we need the candy line to empty the bright tanks so that we can move so that we keep the brewing schedule going so um it is a ripple effect of something when we're having that downtime so the shorter and the faster you can getting that back up and running is you know always number one for us as well um yeah i mean the overall cost of it yeah it's it's hard to wrap in because it's always if you factor in the increasing cost of shipping at the moment, it's always the shipping of everything is always the expensive part about it. Mostly everything right now. So, um, but I do, luckily we have a couple, I got a couple of brewer buddies here in Connecticut that have a goose as well. So if I don't have it, I can call them and drive, you know, the two hours of their place and there and back and then get it installed. And then I'm ordering three cause I have to have the one that I'm installing, the one to return to them. And then the one to, to back the one up I took from them. So, it's uh you know people in the brewing industry are are awesome and wild goose is definitely part of that industry that's awesome and always willing to help so yeah i totally agree um and i'll stay with you one final question because we're almost out of time um how do you measure the value of final can product quality Ooh, that's um i mean <laughs> priceless i mean there's final no like, question <laughs> yeah that's a tough one so i mean we're the 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 the, the value i mean it's 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 everything i mean quality of the beer should be every brewer's number one work and i mean um number one goal excuse me um but it's yeah like it says um Fred who's mentioned it earlier but like you can spend all this time developing a recipe getting the best malts in like perfect cleaning procedures along along the way your tanks are pristine all your lines are perfect but if you have a bad canning run you have bad beer you know, and that's and a lot of times you only have, you have one, you have one chance to present yourself in a good, like if someone's new to grabbing your shot, your product off the shelf, you got one chance. They try it. They're like, Oh, that, that brewery makes bad beer. They'll never buy, they'll never buy a beer from you again. So the quality is always number one and it is the utmost importance. And I tell that to my candy line crew, my keg washing crew is like, you guys have the most important job because you make sure that all this hard work we're doing is presented perfectly to the customer. And how about you, uh, Joe? How do you um, measure the value of the total product quality? I mean, it, it, as said, it's it's the most important part. You know, if, if the beer is coming out of the canning line bad, your customers. Are going to buy it. You know, years ago, uh, my one of my old bosses uh, made a comment that beer does not get better in packaging. And it's a great, you know, packaging is a great way to ruin beer. And, uh, if you can do it right and not ruin your beer, then you're going to have repeat customers and sell more beer and you're going to have uh, success. <laughs> Those are wise words to close on. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Joe and Tyler and Ken for joining us today and providing your insight and sharing with us. I know I learned a lot more from each one of you today and I truly appreciate it. Um, I will see you in Minnesota for the Craft Brewers Conference. And Tyler, I have a customer up in Manchester, so I may find, nice. yeah, I work with a brewery up there. 
And okay. um, I've been working with them for a, a little while. So I might find myself up your way sometime soon right. too. But um, thanks again, for all three of you for joining us today. Thank you for attending the Craft Beer Professional Spring Virtual Conference for our session and enjoy the rest of the conference this week. Happy spring. Cheers. <laughs>